Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Robert Gunther, at United Fresh Produce, and we want to welcome you to uh, our Washington Conference webinar, uh, getting ready for next week's uh, March on Capitol Hill uh, with our, our Washington Conference. Uh, we're excited to have you on the phone again uh, this this year, and, and those who have been, done this before, and uh, we look forward to, to an interesting discussion today. A couple of logistics, few logistics questions before we get started. Uh, all lines are going to be muted for the entire webinar. Uh, we would ask uh, that you uh, use the chat box, box function, uh, which is on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, if you would like to ask a question as we, as we move forward. Uh, also, finally, uh, this webinar will be recorded and will, will be available uh, on the coming days on our United Fresh website, as well as our, our uh, Congressional March on Capitol Hill um, uh, section uh, of, of, of the website uh, to give you more information for those who want to listen to this again or, or share it with, with, their, with, with other people in the industry. So today uh, I am joined by several colleagues of mine, uh, Tyson Redpath with the Russell Group, who uh, that group has been our Legislative Council at United Fresh for, for over 12 years now. Uh, Tyson um, comes with a great deal of background. In, in many issues related to Capitol Hill and Congress, uh, spent a long time on Capitol Hill, and uh, we'll be talking to us today about kind of the agenda for the 2017 Farm Bill. Also, I'm joined by my colleagues uh, Julie Maines, who, are, who is our Director of Government Relations at United Fresh Produce, and Molly Van Lu, uh, our Senior Director of Nutrition Policy at United Fresh. So we're happy to have all these folks uh, to, to join us today and, and, and for this for this webinar and. We'll share some of their perspectives and insights uh, as we as we go through the, the presentation. So, as I mentioned, we're one week away. Uh, actually, today, this afternoon, a week from today, we will be on Capitol Hill uh, during our our famous wa uh, march on, uh, on Capitol Hill, where uh, a number you know all of you will be going to uh, on, on congressional teams and joining the um, joining your your colleagues to to visit with members of Congress. Um, for today's webinar, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about why it's important to come to Washington, D.C. next week, uh, some of the logistics for the congressional meeting, um, a current outlook, Tyson will talk about the current outlook for Congress, then uh, myself, uh, Molly, and, and Julie will go through the key topics of discussion, and then finally at the end, uh, we'll have a chance for, for, for discussion uh, with you, any questions you may have. And as, as we go through this, if you want, again, I want to reemphasize, as we go through the discussion today, when you, if you have any questions, please use the, 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 the box to type in the questions, and at the end we will go through those questions as well. So why is it important to come to Washington? I mean, there's really four really big areas. Advocacy is, is, is really um, the most important thing. Uh, us in D.C., us working at United Fresh, uh, we spend uh, every day of the year uh, working with members of Congress and the administration. You, as a member of the industry, as a constituent of these members of Congress, you are here to advocate on issues that are important to you. Uh, and that's very important to bring that message from home, from their home districts, from their home states, of why you are in Washington, D.C., and what, what these issues will do to impact your industry, your business, your, your operation. Uh, so advocacy is really, you know, as I say here, is the heart of the Washington Conference, and it is the key reason why we have our Washington Conference each year. Advocating for a common interest, uh, again, when members of Congress see folks from different parts of the industry uh, coming together to talk about issues that are very common and how they impact each different segment of the industry, that is a very powerful tool, a very powerful message that, that members of Congress and their staff will hear from, our, from, from all of you when you march on Capitol Hill. It's important to have that common interest of, of issues that, that our industry is focusing on. Uh, strength in numbers, when you have four to 500 people in town, uh, it makes a huge impact. Uh, I think D.C. understands when you have that many people from one industry coming into town, uh, they understand that industry is committed to working with, in Washington, D.C. and working on, with issues related to uh, their industry's, um, uh, industry's interest uh, on issues, whether they're, they're legislative issues or regulatory issues. And then obviously, uh, opportunity for networking. Um, you know, again, this also the Washington meeting gives us a chance to come together as an industry to, to, to talk to other people in the industry about uh, things that are important to them as well. So some logistics about the congressional visits. 
Uh, as I mentioned, really, you know, our view is the centerpiece of our conference is the March on Capitol Hill, uh, meeting with House and Senate offices. Um, this year, uh, as we've done in, in several years in the past, we are having what I consider consolidated congressional visits. They will be in the afternoon of Tuesday, September 19th, a week from today. Uh, we will be having House and Senate visits, which are combined. Uh, in other words, each team will be going to House, the House of Representatives as well as the Senate for, for doing meetings. Uh, you'll be broken up into, into congressional teams. At this time, we have about 45 congressional teams representing 30 states. Um, that have been put together thus far in draft uh, congressional teams. Each team will have a team leader. Uh, and again, those who have been here before, but those who have not been here before, these team leaders are there to help get you around the Capitol efficiently and effectively. They have been to Capitol Hill before. They kind of know their way around the halls, the, the, the basement, the, the, the tunnels of, of, of between the offices. And they're really there to help guide the group around. They're not there to, to lead the discussion necessarily. They're not there to be the only person speaking. This is a team effort and a team group. So everybody should have a role uh, in their teams as they, as they approach each visit from, on Capitol Hill uh, with their members of Congress and Senators. Each team this year will have about three to four meetings uh, with, with, with offices. Uh, again, uh, there will be some offices that um, or some, that some will be mixed with the House and the Senate uh, meetings. In terms of uh, briefing material, uh, I would encourage everybody to uh, check out the, our Washington Conference website. We have a folder in there called March on Capitol Hill uh, where materials related to the congressional visits will be located. Also, uh, we encourage everybody to, to download the, the Washington Conference app. Uh, you can download that today. Uh, that that um, app will also mirror uh, the information we have on our website uh, during uh, next week. And as we go through this week, we will be continuing to add different information to both the, the, uh, the, the Capitol Hill folder on our website, but also the app as well. Uh, we also, at the end of this week, probably on Friday, you will be getting an email uh, that will give you up the most up-to-date information about congressional visits. Um, and then as you are here in, in, uh, during, the, during the conference next week, Two important areas, that I, the two important um, programming things that we're doing on Tuesday prior to going to Capitol Hill. First is our education sessions, which, which will be going on immediately after the, the opening breakfast session. These are issues that these will be issues and, and speakers that will be able to provide you up to the minute reports um, about current issues and priorities on, that are being discussed on Capitol Hill that we think are important that our industry know about, and also that they can take that information and share that as they go to Capitol Hill. Finally, um, we will also be having a Crafting Our Message on Capitol Hill session. That will be myself and some of my colleagues from United Fresh who will be talking about the afternoon visits. And we'll spend about 45 minutes or so in that session. A little bit different this year. Uh, we, when we come back for that session, actually it will be right before the lunch session uh, on Tuesday, um, we will ask people to sit with their teams. Uh, there will be uh, uh, 45 or so tables there. Uh, that will will have the teams um, team team numbers on them, and we'd ask everybody to sit sit with their teams during that session and, and as well as lunch. This will give you time, guys. This will give all the teams time to to talk about who's going to be saying what, what are they going to be focusing on, talk about each of the visits they have, and um, you know kind of be able to start crafting that message and discussion and that strategy as you go into each congressional office. So additional congressional briefing material, again, when you get on site and you, get your, uh, uh, re you register and get your portfolios, there will be a congressional visit guide available. But again, this will tell you what teams you are on, what meetings you will have uh, Tuesday afternoon. You will also be getting, you also, that will also include the issue brief policy paper. We will be, fa we will be emailing that information out prior to, this, prior to the Washington conference, so this week you will be getting that. But also it will be there on Monday when you, when you start, you check in. Uh, we also have our state profiles that we'll be including uh, with the teams. There will be a map on Capitol Hill. And new this year, uh, because we've heard back from a lot of the, the folks who, who attended Washington Conference in, in, in the last several years and also um, uh, some other folks who, who we've worked with, uh, we're going to have a congressional profile uh, of each member that we're visiting with. So this is not going to be an in-depth discussion or, or background on the member, but it's going to give you a short quick, brief summary of things that they support based on the issues we're talking about, 
what committees they serve on, uh, some, in, some interesting information that you will need or you would like to have prior to going into that office that I think will help guide that discussion, the, the discussions on certain issues, the key issues that we're going to be talking about. So that's a new thing this year that we're going to try out, see if folks like it, but again, it's going to be very short, brief uh, comments and commentary about those members and some of the things that we think are important that you need to know going into those offices. So as I've, you know, I've used this slide uh, in multiple occasions with folks coming to Capitol Hill, but really there's kind of six or seven things that we want to really try to focus on when you do your visits for those who, who have not done this before. Uh, first and foremost, you want to try to stay on time for your visits. Um, that's important. If you do get behind, if there's members of Congress, if there's staff that are, that are behind or, or their schedules are, 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 are not in sync with our schedules, make sure that the team leader, and team leaders know this for the most part, make sure that they can, are able to call ahead or email ahead to the office and say, hey, we're running a little bit late. So, but it's important to try to stay on time uh, for the business as most, best you can. Focus, factual, informative. Uh, again, these may be 30-minute meetings, uh, so you need to be crisp. You need to make sure you have your talking points down that you want to make. Um, uh, it makes sure that the information you give is, is factual and informative that the member of Congress or the Senator can, can, can understand and, and, and take back as a, as a way to um, you know, relate the, the issue to, to, to that member of Congress. Uh, ask questions and follow up. Uh, ask the questions. Uh, you know, that, that where do they think the member is or where, where do you think you're going to be in, the, in terms of this issue. Uh, make sure you follow up uh, a letter thanking them for the visit or an email thanking them for the visit. Get, get business cards. Make those connections. Personalize the connection as best you can. Uh, that's my next point. Um, make sure that you're telling, um, you're, you're telling a, a story uh, that really brings this issue into a more personal um, uh, personal relation in terms of, of how to, to make this issue important to your, to your business. Make a request. Invite them out to your, your, your farm, your operation, your business. Uh, invite them you know, to uh, visit your facility or tour, of, tour your facility. Uh, those are things that, 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 that really kind of bond that, that um, process um, um, uh, very nicely uh, as you do the visit. And then try to get a clear answer. Uh, I know that's always tough. Members of Congress don't, sometimes don't want to give you a clear answer, and uh, they might want to say, I want to get back to you on this. I don't know enough about it. Uh, but try to get, make sure that's kind of where the follow-up happens. You know, make sure you, you, get a, you, know, you want to get a clear answer on this issue. And finally, uh, I have this bolded, congressional staff are important allies. There, are some in, 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 there will be some instances next week uh, there where you will be meeting with congressional staff and the member of Congress will not be there or the senator cannot be there, uh, these staff are important uh, to the, the, the function of a congressional office. Uh, they are the ones who are the eyes and ears for the member of Congress. They are the ones who brief them on how the meetings went if they could not be there in person. They are the ones that kind of, you know, you can, you can hopefully sway in, in one direction or another to be supportive of our issues. So they are a very critical part of a congressional office and a member of Congress's staff. Uh, is, is a key important ally, not just to that member, but also to the constituents that they, that the member of Congress represents. So make sure that you spend as much time as you can with them. Again, same thing as you would a member of Congress. Make a request, invite them out when they come to the districts to visit. Follow up with questions, you know, kind of get to know them as best you can because they can be important allies. And you know, if they feel comfortable, they will also reach back out to you when, when these issues come back up and say, hey, this is up, this is coming up, maybe you know, what do you guys think about this, this thing, this bill or this amendment coming forward uh, as, we, as we move forward. So that really covers a lot of the logistics. Uh, I went through that fairly quickly. Um, and um, I um, wanted to um, you know, make sure that um, you guys kind of got a quick briefer on the, on the logistics and stuff like that. Now we're going to turn to the outlook of Congress and the key topics to discuss. Uh, I'm ask, I've, uh, Tyson, are you on the phone? I am. Can you hear me, Robert? Yep, I can hear you great. Um, we're going to turn over to Tyson Redpath, who's going to kind of frame what you know, the Congress just came back uh, in, uh, two weeks ago, a uh, week and a half ago, excuse me, um, and 
Kaisen's going to talk a little bit about kind of what we can expect this fall from Congress uh, as they move forward with their fall and winter agenda. So, Tyson, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and let me know when you want me to switch the slide. Great. Thank you, Robert, very much. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a delight to be on the phone with you. And uh, let me also welcome you and invite you to Washington. Uh, I personally think there's there's been few times, at least in the last uh, decade or so, where it's been as important for your voices to be heard here in Washington. I don't need to tell anyone on the phone that it has been an interesting year, uh, perhaps uh, one of the more um, challenging and interesting transitions we've ever seen, uh, both from a congressional standpoint and certainly from the standpoint of the executive branch um, in the White House and throughout the federal agencies. So I want to welcome you, invite you, uh, and please know um, that your, your voice and, and your presence here is, is perhaps more important than it has been certainly in the recent past. Um, coming back from a four-week, uh, five-week congressional recess, um, Congress immediately has to deal with a few things, uh, and, and please know that nothing motivates legislative action quite like a deadline. September 30th is the deadline for a number of programs, but more importantly, it's the deadline for the government's fiscal year. And already we've seen uh, some challenges to that year-end fiscal year spending uh, uh, budget process needed to keep the government open. Uh, and also, uh, as recently as last week, um, uh, very clear evidence uh, and surprisingly um, a resolution to uh, a potential government funding standoff when President Trump uh, agreed with uh, the Democratic leadership of Congress, namely Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, on a three-year, I'm sorry, three-month uh, continuing resolution to keep all federal agencies and all government programs funded at the fiscal year 2017 level. Of course, the government's fiscal year 2018 begins October 1st, and that also brings with it um, uh, the expiration uh, and the action required of Congress on a couple of different things. The Federal Aviation Administration uh, sees its authority to operate expire uh, September 30th. The Children's Health Insurance Program, a very popular uh, health insurance program for um, lower income children throughout the nation, um, a defense authorization bill. Every year, Congress must act uh, on a bill that authorizes the Department of Defense and the Pentagon to carry out its operations. And then I'm going to go back to one of the bullets there that has certainly increased in prominence and importance um, and, and was something that I don't think anyone envisioned perhaps dealing with uh, as quickly or perhaps in as big of a way when they left for the August recess as they now face now or as they now face after the last couple of weeks, and that being the National Flood Insurance Program. I think both uh, on a fiscal front uh, and even in programs uh, under um, the purview of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, you will see a concerted effort to make sure uh, that disaster relief for agriculture, for, for people, for homes and businesses that have been affected by hurricanes Harvey and Irma, uh, I think you will see um, spending bills and disaster relief measures um, passed quickly. We've already seen one passed at the end of last week, a, a down payment of sorts. Uh, when Congress and the President agreed on a $15 billion uh, disaster relief bill for Houston and the Gulf Coast of Texas to help uh, that area recover from Hurricane Harvey. I think everyone agrees there's certainly more that needs to be done. And I would mention that um, I think both agriculture committees in the House and Senate along with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, are beginning to tally the effects 
of both hurricanes that I know are are in regions certainly important to this industry are beginning to tally uh, exactly how much was lost, the estimates of damage that have been incurred uh, from those hurricanes, and I believe will act promptly um, to to pass or at least administer some type of disaster relief. Um, so what that has all done is it has meant that in that um, second category of legislative priorities on the slide you're looking at has probably been pushed back by some degree. Uh, certainly when you come, a lot of what you will hear, I know it's the topic of some panel discussions and certainly will be the topic of discussion in both the House and Senate, is tax reform. Tax legislation continues to be a top priority for the White House, uh, as well as uh, congressional Republican leadership, and I would think uh, even bipartisan members from both sides of the aisle have certainly expressed a desire uh, to rewrite, uh, if not significantly overhaul, our current tax law, including personal tax and corporate tax. Uh, I think doing something on taxes has certainly received heightened importance, uh, if not increased attention because of the failure of congressional Republicans to address health care and reform health care uh, pursuant to the Affordable Care Act, which had been a long-standing campaign pledge um, that now appears to be fleeting. Um, uh, I don't think it's any secret that uh, uh, both the House and Senate, uh, frankly, uh, spent an exorbitant amount of time the first seven months of this uh, legislative session on trying to deal or rewrite uh, significant portions of the Affordable Care Act. Um, there is still uh, the chance and discussion on uh, perhaps doing more minor modifications to the Affordable Care Act. Um, as September turns to October, the government must begin negotiating rates with health insurance companies that participate in the health insurance exchanges still operating throughout the country. Um, so while I believe, I think most believe, major reforms to the Affordable Care Act are now unlikely, there still is the possibility for uh, some minor um, revisions to the law and through the Department of Health and Human Services an opportunity to change key pieces that affect uh, both the rates of premiums paid and um, the operation of the health care exchanges uh, where they still exist. I know uh, infrastructure uh, is certainly something that came up a lot during uh, President Trump's campaign for the White House and was certainly something that um, both the White House and the President himself spent considerable time talking about earlier this year. Um, it is still being discussed. Uh, however, if we look at the fall agenda and dealing with some of those items I've already talked about, uh, time um, to do anything on infrastructure in 2017 uh, appears to be slipping. Um, so it is still a topic I think very much worth uh, following, evaluating, and discussing, but I don't believe it is at the top uh, of the fall agenda uh, for this Congress currently. The next slide um, perhaps gets more uh, to, to matters, policy, and certainly personnel that affect our industry very much. Uh, as I note there, personnel equals policy. And what I mean by that, especially with a new administration, um, the people that are in key positions of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Food and Drug Administration, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, certainly matter a whole lot in determining um, rules and regulations, how laws are carried out, um, and that's never more important than in the early days of a new administration. 
Now, most of you will remark that we are no longer in the early days of this administration, which is very true. However, the pace at which key appointments uh, made by the President and confirmed by the Senate is at a historically slow pace. Uh, there are any number of reasons for that, but it is safe to say that this President and his cabinet, more importantly the sub-cabinet, so those agencies that I just spoke of, uh, find fewer appointees and fewer officials uh, actually operating the day-to-day -day functions than we've seen certainly in any recent administration. Um, the president's appointees and those confirmed are uh, lagging well behind the administration uh, of Barack Obama and George W. Bush. So there, the point is there are still a lot of empty seats, uh, a lot of uh, empty positions open in the Trump administration. However, uh, at USDA and at USTR, uh, a number of key appointments will be considered during this month and even during the week in which you are here. Uh, that being uh, Steve Sensky, who uh, is nominated to be the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, so he would be the number two uh, position behind Secretary Purdue. His nomination hearing is scheduled for next week. Uh, as is um, a couple of other undersecretaries and some undersecretaries that have been named at USDA, uh, Bill Northey from Iowa, Ted McKinney from Indiana, who, interestingly enough, will become the new undersecretary for trade and foreign agricultural affairs, um, as well as uh, Greg Ibach, who has been nominated uh, out of the state of Nebraska to be the undersecretary for marketing and regulatory programs certainly a position that impacts uh, this industry a considerable amount. Uh, the last uh, position I'll touch on uh, is an important one, uh, especially now uh, within the purview of this administration as it seeks to, you know, frankly, challenge a lot of the conventional wisdom on trade agreements that we've seen over the past two decades, uh, that being the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and more recently, the Korean-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. That position is the Agriculture Ambassador of the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, uh, and the individual nominated to fill that post is Greg Dowd. Uh, Greg comes from a long history in production agriculture and more recently worked at the Commodity Markets Council. His nomination hearing will also be uh, scheduled for next week. So. That is just a sampling of what's going on here in Washington, both from a, uh, perhaps a larger overview of national policy, uh, but also in terms of personnel policy and positions that really affect uh, the produce industry as well as agriculture. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Great. Thank you, Tyson. Uh, are you going to be able to stay on in case there's any questions? Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Tyson. Uh, now we're going to turn to uh, four issues that we uh, are going to focus on next week on Capitol Hill. Um, let me start uh, with the guest worker immigration reform. And, and, I, and despite kind of several years of, of, of no action, we do see that there is some support, obviously, and some potential movement related to an ag solution. And some of that is coming, you know, from the, from the, from the administration, including Secretary Sonny Perdue, uh, those in the White House, but also uh, up on, the, on Capitol Hill in the House side. Uh, Chairman of the House Ag Committee, Mike Conaway, has mentioned this several times, whether it's been during committee hearings. Uh, uh, he's been on the road. Uh, I had a chance to be with him in California uh, in August when they were doing farm bill listening sessions out there. Um, but also a, a, a very strong bipartisan group of House Ag, committers, committee, committee, uh, House Ag Committee members are strongly trying to uh, push forward a solution for agriculture. Uh, Chairman Bob Goodlad of the Judiciary Committee is in the process of finishing up a draft legislation called the Agriculture Workforce Act or the Ag Act. Um, this bill uh, is similar to a bill he introduced about two or three years ago, uh, but it has certainly moved significantly in our direction with this new draft. Um, 
the bill, uh, while it helps address, and I'll get into some of the, a few of the details of this of this bill, uh, certainly moves in our direction. It's not everything that we need, uh, but the chairman, uh, his staff, and others uh, has expressed a very strong willingness to work together. Uh, some of you may know uh, that are going to be here and have seen our, our reports. Uh, chairman Goodlight will be joining us uh, on Wednesday uh, at our lunch, or excuse me, on Tuesday at our lunch session. Uh, he will be uh, able to talk to us about the current update on his bill uh, and his plans on how it's going to move forward uh, in, his in his committee uh, that he's chair of, which is the House Judiciary Committee. So the question is for us, is some movement better than none? So when you look at this bill, really two major components. It creates a new guest worker program or H2C program. It moves the program to, from the Department of Labor to the Department of Agriculture. You can get up to a three-year visa for these guest workers. Uh, the, the, the pay would be 15% premium over minimum wage. The bill is silent on housing and transportation. As, much as, you, as, much, as some of you know, on H2, the H2A program, there is a requirement for housing and transportation. This bill stays silent on that. There is a cap on new workers uh, with a 10 of 500,000 uh, with a 10% annual escalation uh, provision put into that into that um, uh, new guest worker program. Currently under H-2A, there is no cap under that program. There's also a provision that converts current undocumented workers into a legal status. Um, those workers would be transitioned into the H-2C program and would be protected from deportation while in transition. There are no penalties and fees required at this point in time. Um, and during that time frame that they are under the H2C, they must return home or do a touchback, it's called, uh, uh, of undefined within six months of H2C status. And those workers who are transitioned do not count against the 500,000 person cap. So those are key components of the new bill. So what are the concerns? Um, it, as we also talked about um, the Ag Act and moving it forward uh, in the House Judiciary Committee, they also, uh, last Friday, uh, Congress, or at least some members of Congress, uh, Lamar Smith from Texas, introduced a mandatory E-Verify uh, uh, bill. We expect both of those bills to be considered at the same time, uh, so a, a, a mandatory E-Verify uh, bill as well as um, a Ag Guest Worker bill will be considered by the House Judiciary Committee at some point uh, this month maybe as uh, early as this week, but most likely um, in a couple of weeks. Um, so we are concerned about that, of one not moving, or at least E-Verify moving ahead of the Ag Bill. They must move simultaneously, and we believe eventually they must be put together as a package before they get to the House floor and voted on as a package. The other concerns we have is kind of what, what exactly, how many percentage of the current workers were truly transitioning transition into H2C. What we have told Capitol Hill and we've told people in the administration, this may be a one-shot opportunity. Those folks are currently here under an illegal stat or uh, undocumented status. Um, they are going to be asked to come out of those shadows, so to speak, and transition into some legal status. It is going to be critical that that process be a process that, that can be trusted and, and can work both for the worker but also the, the, the folks who are currently employing those workers uh, uh, in their in their operations, and you know we're not sure the impact of own family members. We're very concerned about that, you know. And the country return requirements are unclear as well in the bill. The cap on meet on new workers is a concern as well. Uh, we pro we most likely believe, and if you look at most statistics, we need far and above a five hundred thousand dollars five hundred thousand person cap. Um, it also includes a, a provision in the bill that adds processing to this. So how, what will be the impact of new workers that also are in the processing industry, at least in terms of, 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 of food processing? The contract and at will provisions are concerned. And then the pay rate is still unclear exactly how that would work state by state in terms of the, the, um, how it would react or be, be countered on, on, on the minimum wage process. So what's the path, path moving forward? As I mentioned, um, the Good Lab bill will be introduced this month. Um, we expect from when, well, the, the bill we, we have been, the draft bill that has been out there publicly, there will be some minor changes but not a lot of them. We also expect that bill will be marked up this month. It will also will be marked up uh, as a companion bill to the E-Verify, mandatory E-Verify legislation. 
again, the question is if those bills pass out of committee, which we would expect they would, it will probably be on a party line vote, uh, what will be the strategy of our Republican leadership to bring it to the House floor? And could it pass on its own in today's environment? You know, there's a lot of discussions going on about how that's going to work, uh, what would be the right combination of bills, potentially, as I mentioned, E-Verify and, um, and a, a Ag Guest Worker Bill, um, how could, what kind of package you could put together that could bring uh, enough members of Congress, at least on the House side, to pass the bill. What, if, it, if we can get to that process and get the right mix of members, then it's up to the Senate. And quite frankly, as you know, Tyson mentioned, there's been a lot of challenges getting Senate to, to, to do much this, this, this Congress over the first nine months or so. Uh, and then we have very sharp divisions, uh, and quite frankly, between the Democrats and Republicans in the Senate about what they would support related to immigration reform. Uh, Democrats support legalizing the current workers. There's a blue card bill that Senator Feinstein and others have introduced, while the Republicans have shown really not too much any support that we, you know, we can really sh see in terms of, of, of an ag uh, reform bill. Uh, but there has been a mandatory E-Verified bill introduced by the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, 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 Chairman Grassley of, of Iowa. So our conclusion right now on this issue is we need to continue to push ahead and see how far we can go. That is one reason why it's very important that you guys are in town in September uh, next week to really kind of keep the House moving forward and, and at best we make some good progress in this, in, in this, in this effort. Um, at the worst case scenario, we continue to drive attention to the labor crisis in agriculture. Uh, you, you guys all know we've had this issue on our agenda for many, many years as it needs to be fixed. We think there's a window right now to, to, to potentially address this, this ag uh, guest worker issue. Um, we also need to push the Chairman Goodlatte and other ag leaders to get needed changes in the bill. As I mentioned, we, there are a number of concerns with the bill. Uh, and if the bill does pass the House, we need to be ready for a Senate plan um, uh, once it passes the House representative. And finally, what I'll, I'll also mention, a new caveat to this that's happened over the last several weeks is the, is the DACA debate uh, on the DREAMers. We feel that that moving some type of immigration related to DACA, DACA really does provide a, a vehicle or, a, or a, a reason to also include some of these other provisions, whether it's E-Verify, but obviously the ag component as well to that. Um, I'm going to stop there and, and ask Julie if she would like to, to talk about any other issues I might miss from, that, from, that, um, from, from the immigration side. Um, thanks, Robert. I, basically, I would just add, you know, just to kind of emphasize the point that, that you've made that um, this, we are in a different atmosphere now than we've been in for the last, uh, you know, three or four or five years. There does seem to be some genuine momentum um, towards taking some kind of action on immigration policy, particularly in the House. Um, I think the Sen I'm, I'm getting some indications on the Senate side that maybe they're kind of starting to rethink whether or not um, they should take some action on immigration policy. I think pre earlier this spring and summer they were inclined not to, but now I think that's kind of changed with, um, as you mentioned, the DACA decision, um, also the, all the discussions that, that continue to be had about um, a border wall um, and the impact that that has on uh, budget uh, debate and budget decisions. So um, I just really would just kind of second what you said, Robert, in terms of um, we really do have some genuine um, movement going forward on um, an immigration policy. So having folks here to really talk about what that means for their operations um, and what it means for not just on the farm, but for operations on down the, the supply chain, uh, I think would be really, really essential for our folks to hear. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good time for folks to be here to talk about this issue. Great. Thank you, Julie. Uh, on that for that for those comments. Next, we're going to turn to the Farm Bill. And um, while the Farm Bill doesn't expire until uh, September 2018, there's been a, a lot of work this this spring, summer, into the fall on the Farm Bill, getting ready for the reauthorization of the next Farm Bill. And really, the Farm Bill is real, it, it, you know kind of boils down to one of the most one of the most important pieces of legislation that impacts the food system. It, it, this, it, it basically passes, uh, the law passes what crops are subsidized, how much food costs, how land is used, and also helping low-income Americans. Uh, it also works, um, you know, kind of dictates international food aid and international trade, and it really serves as an investment of hundreds of programs across the agriculture uh, spectrum. 
Um, where are we uh, come from uh, in, in, in the Farm Bill efforts? As most of you know, you know the, the produce industry has not really necessarily been overly involved in the Farm Bill uh, up until about the 2002 Farm Bill. And really, at this point in time, going into 2018 or authorization, this law all now represents the, the, the largest investment in produce in the produce industry at $600 million annually uh, to our industry. In 2002, uh, since 2002, we've seen a 10, 10, uh, almost tenfold increase in funding through the Farm Bill, which equates to about $3 billion over the, over the life of, from 2014 to 2018. Uh, and these programs really represent uh, key areas such as research, block grants, nutrition, pest and disease, trade policies. Uh, all of these areas are really focused on, we, we, have, we have been able to focus them on um, specialty crops in the fruit and vegetable industry. I've got a couple of charts here that uh, I can share with you, um, you know, that we'll have up as a resource uh, for the Farm Bill discussions uh, that you can download. Uh, but this kind of shows the increase in key programs and why they're important to the Farm Bill as well. So part of our effort, or the majority of our efforts, really is channeled through what's called the Specialty Crop Farm Bill Alliance. It is the coalition uh, that has developed our, you know, our policy and lobbying efforts in the 2008 and 2014 Farm Bill. We, United Freshers, as, as, as coordinating the, as, uh, as the secretariat for the coalition, uh, but it really is a vast majority of produce and specialty crop organizations from across the country. It is co-chaired by the Florida Food and Vegetable Association, National Potato Council, and Western Growers. There are 22 different organizations from across the country on the steering committee, and there's 140 organizations actually as members today, and that ranges from fruit and vegetable organizations, tree nut, the wine industry, nursery and landscape industry, um, wide range, state, local, regional, national associations, all across this country that represent what we call specialty crops uh, and most predominantly fruit and vegetables. We also have six policy committees that are focusing on different priorities, uh, and they are based on different titles of the Farm Bill. Um, and we also have a legislative committee uh, that, that meets uh, here in Washington, D.C. pretty much every week to talk about what we're going to do that week uh, in advancing the Farm Bill. So what have we been doing uh, in the Farm Bill Alliance? In August, the steering committee approved 38 policy recommendations for the 2018 Farm Bill, which cover about nine different, well, do cover nine different titles of the Farm Bill. And as I mentioned earlier, these cover several major areas. Targeting research, a program called the Special Crop Research Initiative is very important. Access to more fruits and vegetables through nutrition programs, like the Fresh Fruit and Vegetables Program, SNAP um, program, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Pest and disease exclusion, so programs that try to prevent pest and disease from coming into this country, but also providing funding and necessary technical and, and uh, work uh, if a pest and disease comes into this country, how to, to eradicate it. Our specialty crop block grant program, which is, goes to all 50 states and helps promote specialty crops, including, most importantly, fruits and vegetables um, in each state and in local communities and trying to enhance their competitiveness across the country and, and worldwide. And then trade promotion as well uh, is important through the market access program, technical assistance for specialty crops. At this point in time, the House and Senate Ag Committees, as we've mentioned, have already started reviewing proposals for the next Farm Bill. Uh, we will be spending the next several days up on Capitol Hill talking to the House and Senate Agriculture Committees, which have the responsibility of rewriting the new Farm Bill. We'll be working, the Special Crop Farm Bill Alliance will be talking to them the, the remainder of this week about these 38 different recommendations. So when you're in town next week, uh, this will be your first opportunity to really reach out to a broad spectrum of other members of Congress and their offices who will want to know what issues are important as, part of, as the Farm Bill comes, comes up for reauthorization. And at this point in time, we feel that, um, that the uh, committee, uh, at least the House Act Committee, is planning to start drafting the Farm Bill this fall uh, and potentially even having a, a markup in the committee uh, late, later this year or early next year uh, as part of their farm, but before it gets to the House floor. And the Senate's not too far behind. So again, it's very important, as it looks like on immigration, that we are in town this month and especially next week to, to, to reemphasize these key policy areas that are important as the Farm Bill is starting to be rewritten. So again, our conclusion and kind of big messages for next week, we are a critical part of agriculture. Uh, our industry is very unified in supporting the Special Crop Farm Bill Alliance recommendations. And I think, you know, again, mentioning trade promotion, pest and disease, research, 
uh, block grants, uh, nutrition programs, are all key areas that we want to make sure that continue to, they have funding now. We want to continue that funding in the next farm, but, but also potentially enhance that funding where, where, where needed. So again, I'll ask Julie to, to step in here and uh, mention anything that I might have missed. Yeah, um, thanks, Robert. I would just um, reiterate how important it is for, um, for the entire industry to come together and speak uh, with a unified voice um, in support of these programs. I think it's a real, it's a real indication of the, how effective our industry can be, in, given the fact that in the last Farm Bill, um, the Congress basically accepted our recommendations almost as is, and that is a real rarity um, in the Farm Bill debate. For us to achieve that kind of um, consensus support tells you that um, Congress wants to hear from our industry, they want to hear our voices, and that they do respond when they do. So um, it's a, a really great, uh, great thing that folks are going to be in town um, at this time. And like Robert said, we're, we're on the cusp of being able to continue that tremendous track record of success, but really only if people make sure that they come to town and uh, make their voices heard. Great. Great, Julie. Now, we're going to switch to nutrition, uh, but also this has a um, kind of a parallel track to uh, the farm bill. Um, and before I, you know, kind of get into a couple of the key issues on nutrition that we want to talk about on Capitol Hill next week, I want to kind of remind folks of, of the if efforts that United Fresh and industry has done over the last, you know, 10 plus years uh, on helping increase access to fruit and vegetables in federal nutrition programs. And three programs such as the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, which provides 4 million low-income students with a fresh fruit and vegetable snack every day. Currently, we have 8 million WIC recipients receiving a monthly voucher for fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, through the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Bill of 2010, 30 million students are benefiting every day from receiving a wide variety of fruit and vegetables in school meals because of the doubling of the or, or increasing uh, servings by over a half cup. Our Let's Move Salad Bar campaign has donated over 5,000 salad bars and benefits over, uh, over 2 million students each day. And then finally, uh, $100 million in the Feeney grants, which I'll talk about in a second, provide incentives for SNAP families to purchase more fresh fruits and vegetables. All these programs have really benefited that access uh, to in, in nutrition policy at the federal level, and in, in, again, benefiting our industry in particular. Two key areas that will impact during the Farm Bill debate are the Fresh Fruit and Vegetables Program and SNAP. Um, both these programs, the reason why they're really important in the next Farm Bill is because they both will be reauthorized, quite frankly, in, in the Farm Bill. And, you know, they will be, both be under uh, scrutiny regarding their effectiveness and application. So on SNAP, uh, some of the policy changes that increase SNAP families' access to a wide variety of fruits and vegetables year-round. Um, that's our goal of ours, to, to improve eating habits and public health. There are many organizations now that are supporting um, uh, making SNAP healthier. The American Heart Association, SNAP, SNAP, state SNAP agencies, members of Congress are all calling for policy changes to make SNAP healthier. And there's really two camps that are, that, that kind of two policy camps that are kind of um, competing with each other related to what, we, what they think could make SNAP healthier. One is financial incentives, incentives to buy more fresh fruits and vegetables, and others are restricting, restricting purchases like of sugary sweetened beverages and candy uh, that they would not be allowed under the SNAP program. The 2018 vehicle as a farm bill um, is a, it will be the legislative vehicle to accomplish these incremental policy changes to improve SNAP. Um, in previous farm bills, actually, we have been very involved in taking small steps towards that goal in terms of incentives. Uh, in the 2008 Farm Bill, there was a $25 million pilot called the Healthy Incentive Pilot Program. And then in 2014, I mentioned the $100 million for produce incentives and Feeney grants. Um, that program, uh, again, provided incentives, incentives to local level to create some programs that create incentives to buying more fruits and fr fresh fruit and vegetables uh, with SNAP, SNAP funding. Uh, but most of that went to local fruit and vegetables and farmers markets. Part of our effort in the 2018 Farm Bill is to create a, a Feeney 2.0, so to speak, and really to, to increase the supportive incentives uh, for, for, for SNAP. Um, two real big key areas for that is, the, as I mentioned, the Feeney grants must incentivize purchases of all fresh fruits and vegetables, not just local fruits and vegetables. But also, really bringing in supermarket and major retail chains must be engaged. 
um, they are the they are the major uh, 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 major outlets for SNAP recipients to buy their buy their buy their food, and therefore we want to make sure that they have a more more uh, important role in developing these these incentives uh, for SNAP re SNAP recipients. On the fresh fruit and vegetable program, our goal is continue to keep fresh uh, in the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, in the last Farm Bill, there was a pilot program uh, that evaluated, uh, um, um, evaluated the fresh fruit and vegetable program that allowed some schools to provide all forms. And the results of that were, were very dis discouraging. Uh, really, uh, it, it, the students' um, consumption decreased during the pilot program of fruit and vegetables. There were very few vegetable serves, calories increased. Students preferred fresh fruit and vegetables. Parents wanted fre and, and parents wanted fresh fruit and vegetables to stay fresh. Dried and canned fruit substituted for fresh fruit and vegetables. And quite frankly, nationwide, the schools do not want this want want the school to change the program from all to, to from fresh fruit and vegetables to all forms. There is a bill right now that's been introduced in the House, HR 3402. That will that will change fresh fruit and vegetables to all forms, and obviously we right now oppose that oppose that legislation. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, ask um, Molly uh, to join me and again cover anything that I might I might have missed. Thanks, Robert. Uh, this is Molly. I look forward to meeting everybody next week. Um, just wanted to emphasize a couple points. Um, as Robert discussed, there's kind of two camps still in the SNAP reform debate: um, some for restrictions. Um, some to increase the incentives for fruit and vegetables, and realistically, in this next farm bill, we're probably more likely to see um, an emphasis on incentives. So I think that that's a real opportunity um, for us to talk about increasing that investment in feeding and the uh, the direct incentive to buy fresh fruit and vegetables. So that's an opportunity for us. And then um, just doubling down on that new report of the fresh fruit and vegetable program um, that showed that overall consumption when the fresh fruit and vegetable program was expanded to all forms, that uh, kids ate a quarter cup fewer fruits and vegetables per day when it was expanded to all forms. So I just wanted to kind of emphasize those two areas. Great. Thank you, Molly. So last thing we're going to talk about, and Tyson touched on this, was tax reform. Um, as Tyson mentioned, you know, stars seem to be aligning on tax reform policy. President Trump has said it's a top priority. He announced in August that he, that was one of the issues he wanted to get addressed this fall, congressional agenda. Um, Republicans in Congress have wanted to do tax reform. Uh, Speaker Paul Ryan has sought a broad-based reform throughout his entire career. Uh, even Democrats agree that the current system is broken. There is strong support for tax reform across the many different uh, groups, uh, business community, uh, but really it comes down to the details of how that, that tax reform is going to look. And you know, this really does present the first time in 30 years we have seen opportunity for comprehensive tax reform. For the produce industry, it's clearly, it, it, there is increasing industry dynamics because of the diversity of our business structures. We have family businesses, the ESOPs, in our business structure. Um, we have uh, LLCs. We have diff so many different types of business structures that it's hard to kind of put your hand on or put your finger on one thing that would help the produce industry. It's going to really depend on how your business is structured and what is going to be that message for us. Corporate reform only uh, would be a disadvantage, we feel, to, to the produce industry, which is what some people in the business community uh, feel is going to be you know, kind of the easiest path forward is just to do corporate only reform. But there are some areas of agreements that I think we all can agree on. Tax extenders, uh, state tax reform, lowering the capital gains tax, and maintaining interest deduction on business expenses. Those are issues that the food and ag industry have been very focused on and want to continue to push as a, as a package of, of things that we'd like to see in a final tax package. Um, the bottom line really is um, we do support tax reform, but it needs to be balanced, and it needs to represent really the different interests so we can see positive effects on all parts of our industry in terms of profitability and economic growth. So that's really one of our key messages for that. So in summary, and again, I'd ask folks to, to uh, go ahead and, um, if you have any questions at this point in time, to go ahead and write them in. Um, on immigration, no EU verify without passing comprehensive solution for agriculture. On the Farm Bill, we are an important part of, of 
you know, needing to tell Congress uh, part, critical part of a U.S. agriculture and that we're unified behind the Special Crop Farm Bill Alliance recommendations. Uh, we support uh, Feeney 2.0. We want to keep fre the fresh fruit and vegetable program fresh. And the tax reform must recognize the diversity of our industry and create a level playing field for all, not just certain groups. So those are the key messages we want to carry next week to Capitol Hill uh, for, for our messages as we, as we uh, visit with members of Congress uh, and their staff. Um, with that, we're kind of uh, done with the uh, presentation. We got time for a few questions. Um, and I just wanted to um, 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 open it up for some questions here. And one of the questions that we have right now, uh, I'm going to go to Molly uh, on the nutrition stuff. And basically, Molly, uh, one of the questions is, um, why is why is there such a strong why is there attack on the fresh fruit and vegetable program? Um, you know, every seems like every year we're, we're, we're having to make this fight. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think, and you could, you know, probably answer yeah. this as well, of course. But um, you know, anytime that there is an opportunity for um, for money available from a federal program to get products. Um, I think that people pay attention and try to see how um, how they can enter into that. And I think that there's, um, you know, schools, sometimes there's, um, they discuss with schools that it might be easier to, because there's the processing sometimes of fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables that you don't have. Um, in the other forms, but when you really kind of dig down and look at how it's implemented at schools, um, it's, more, it's not just um, a snack program, it's a nutrition education program. So when schools are implementing it and they actually see the results, it increases the um, consumption of fruits and vegetables in uh, school breakfast and school lunch. Um, but frankly, I think that it is a little confusing that despite all of the, the research and the evidence and the evaluation that's been done on the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program that shows that schools prefer it, parents prefer it, students prefer it, um, and there's really positive outcomes and it still is under attack um, is a little bit concerning, but I think we just have to continue to get the message out and tell the story um, that, that it works. Um. Another question that's come up is about immigration reform, and are we really, you know, going to see any any significant changes uh, this time around? Um, and let me let me try to answer that. Um, I do think there is a window here. Continue, Tyson. You might want to weigh in as well. I do think there's a window here. Uh, certainly, the DACA uh, issue has, has has kind of risen as a as I mentioned before, a potential vehicle for immigration reform. Um, Democrats are very interested in getting that fixed. The President's very interested in getting that fixed. The question is what else can be, uh, um, can be included in some type of immigration package. Certainly agriculture has made their case over the years, the many, many years that we have said we need a new guest worker program, we need a, a new, new program to, or we need, we need a way to um, bring a current workforce into some type of legal status. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, Chairman Goodlatte has, um, uh, has driven that kind of, you know, at least has given us that opportunity to at least begin that discussion with the bill he's planning to introduce. If that committee does move forward with an E-Verified mandatory bill, uh, they also move, you know, and move forward with an Ag bill, it gives us a vehicle to, to continue that discussion. As we mentioned, it's not perfect. Uh, certainly, we want to see significant changes or changes to the bill, but we do want to be supportive of his efforts to get that out of committee and at least get it in discussions for the House. As many of you know, the House has really been our, 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 our challenge over the last number of years to do anything on immigration reform. We've spent a lot of time in the Senate. Uh, they've been more receptacle, rece receptive to, to doing immigration reform more on a comprehensive basis. But this has really been, we think, our first window of, of trying to get immigration uh, through the House. And if we can get it through the House, you know, certainly I think we can create some momentum to, to move something in the Senate, especially in, li in, in light of the DACA discussions. Tyson, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, Robert, and, and I will echo what you said. Uh, you know, I know that the DACA announcement last week and I think this is something that is very instructive. It immediately draws outcry and criticism, and perhaps rightfully so. But 
but it also I think lost in there is is frankly the president turned this back on Congress and I think a lot of people would argue again maybe that is uh, the right place for you know legislation to take shape on a whole sundry of immigration related items so um, whatever your views of what the president did what it did do is put immigration policy squarely back in the court of Congress to do something about it. Uh, I would also say, and, and you know, uh, we can talk about this more next week, but there have been very high level, very, very high level discussions at the White House um, with, uh, I think, a number of the lawmakers Robert mentioned uh, about addressing agriculture's problem. Uh, and so, you know, I think the challenge for all of us is to make sure that we continue to to keep uh, this issue front and center for members of Congress and, and note the importance uh, to agriculture, because I will say that, that these high-level discussions going on between the White House and Congress have been focused on agriculture. We don't need to get bogged down in, in sort of broader discussions about other industries or about maybe some of the societal issues that go along with it. But I think there's a clear recognition from, from frankly, the, the commander-in-chief himself that uh, agriculture workforce issues need to be resolved, and it's something he wants to do. Great. Thank you, Tyson. Um, we are a little bit over time, and I know there were several questions in the queue that we will try to get back to folks individually or as a group. Um, uh, we'll get some answers to those as well. Uh, we want to thank everybody for being on the phone today. We look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, we're really excited about the program and the, and the conference next week to have everybody in town. Again, a very opportune time to, to be here in Washington, D.C. to really drive our messages to our, to our elected officials and, and the administration. So uh, safe travels um, later on this week or early next week to get here, and I look forward to seeing you uh, next week at the Washington Conference. Have a good day and, and, and take care. Bye-bye.